So we're gonna we're gonna talk a bit about cannabis, a bit of a cannabis 101. Uh, I'm also joined today by uh, Ms. Christelle Zakarki. Christelle is um, uh, a clinical pharmacist and also uh, the lead of one of the primary care networks uh, pain programs, uh, Mosaic, here in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, she has no disclosures uh, other than doing some independent education programs, which I've also done and one of them with her. Uh, I've also done a bit of consulting, i.e. I've been to an advisory board a couple of times with Spectrum uh, or uh, Canopy and with Tilray. I also have a CIHR grant looking at cannabis' effect on migraine uh, that was uh, co-sponsored by Terra Life Sciences, which uh, grows cannabis for research purposes, and I have a Health Canada SUOP grant. Uh, before we get started, I really want to uh, let you know that there is an incredible uh, program here in Alberta uh, run by Sunil Rajput uh, looking at cannabis in the 21st century and specifically uh, how we can do things digitally. This is a huge uh, platform and I've been uh, very lucky to work with uh, uh, Sunil on this and uh, look forward to seeing where this takes us. But research is front and center here in Alberta. Before I also start, I'd like to welcome Christelle, who will be joining me on this. I will be uh, pausing throughout the presentation and quickly asking her uh, questions, uh, basically asking from a pharmacist perspective what you think. So I think the first thing we should talk about is what is this stuff? What is cannabis? Um, so cannabis uh, is broken down step by step. So cannabis itself is sativa, indica, hybrid, there's also another plant called ruderalis, which we don't see very often. Uh, marijuana is a term representing dried leaves and flowering heads. Uh, and then when we start isolating some of those pure compounds, we start looking at non-cannabinoids, which we'll talk about in a sec, and the cannabinoids. Often the cannabinoids, before we started looking at more of the medicinal purposes of cannabis, was really focused on THC and how much THC you can pack into it. Uh, the ones that we now look a lot at is THC, the psychoactive component, CBD, which is not really psychoactive, but with regards to being euphoric, but actually has some pretty strong uh, anxiolytic and antipsychotic properties, as well as anti-inflammatory properties. And then there's, you know, when I first made this slide, there were 60. Now there's more than 130 other cannabinoids that honestly we don't know a lot about. Uh, things like CBC and CBN and so many more that we're still learning as to exactly what they do outside of a Petri dish. And often when I speak about cannabis, I often let people know the theme of the lecture today is we don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know, but I'll try to take an anecdotal approach of what I do with people and what we've seen so far. Here's your subspecies. So there's sativa, which is often quite tall, there's indicas, which are shorter and fatter, and there's ruderalis, which is kind of just a weed. Uh, but I actually have seen, as we see more of the cannabis cultures and cannabis cups and, uh, you know, some of these new cannabis platforms, some ruderalis plants are being cultivated. So kind of interesting to see that now. Here's some of the constituents. This is a really crazy graph. I'm not asking you to try to figure things out here. But what I really want you to see is that there's flavonoids, which really provide flavors, uh, the lignans, the different terpenes. Now, honestly, it's the terpenes that we get pretty excited about. Now, I have to admit, when I first started lecturing about cannabis a few years ago, the focus was always on CBD versus THC. That's what we really focused on. Uh, we didn't really know much about entourage effects or what the terpenes do or what they really mean. We have come a long way in starting to realize a lot of that. Much of that comes from uh, some anecdotal and observational studies. Much of it comes from some of the newer research that we're seeing. Uh, when we start looking at these things like myrcene, myrcene is one of the most important terpenes when we look at uh, sleep. So you can have the same level of THC and the same level of CBD in two separate oils or uh, strains and have totally different effects on, on alertness and sleep. And it's often the level of myrcene that we see in more of our um, less, sorry, 
I mean, I mean, we see it in the indicas, we don't see it in, in the sativas as much, but it gets a little tricky because Mendelian genetics or the breeding that has occurred has crossed these plants so many times that we often don't see pure uh, strains. Most of them are hybrids of some sort. Um, so, and you know, limine is actually really important anti-inflammatory as is pinene. So these are other things that we're often looking at. Uh, and so more and more we're seeing our licensed producers starting to show us exactly how much of the terpenes are there to give us an idea, are we gonna help for sleep? Are we gonna help for inflammation and so forth? Uh, when we look at cannabis itself and we break it down to the microscopic, this is the trichrome. The trichrome is exactly where the THC is on the leaf, the cannabinoids on the leaf and on the buds. Uh, in, in some plants, this represents a thorn or a needle. Uh, here, it represents a sticky substance that has slowly grown uh, on the outside of the leaf or bud. We usually want to stop at about D. D is the ideal time to cultivate. We start going too far. We start mixing in too much THC and we lose some of the entourage effects. So this is often where we're looking at cultivating is under a microscope, not even a microscope, but a uh, magnifying glass, we want to see it looking something like D. Now, when we start talking about THC versus CBD, classically, what we used to think is that THC was for getting high and, you know, it's for uh, people smoking pot and CBD was medical. That's not really actually that accurate or true. And in fact, uh, when we look at the endocannabinoid system, it is everywhere throughout our body, concentrated in our brain, but absolutely everywhere. So CBD, there's CB1 and CB2 receptors. These receptors that the, the THC and the CBD hit are really all over our body. And we have our whole own endogenous system uh, of cannabinoids that are working internally, uh, similar to many other systems in our body. So if I switch over, you know, often I like to ask uh, the pharmacist or my colleagues, so, you know, when you're explaining to a patient the difference between CBD and THC, what are the some of the things that we go to? So I'm going to pass this over to Christelle. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Tange and I, as he's mentioned, are going to do our best to go through the 101 uh, of cannabis. So sure, I, I think the key thing is that there's so much information to sift through, whether it be the different plant forms, whether it be hybrid whether it be the different constituents, I think the key thing is to understand what's, what do you know and what have you heard and let's sift through all the information. So when we think of THC, it may be that hallucinogenic or feeling high, but the key thing is that that may not be the case depending on when it's blended or when it's combined with CBD, which may not have that hallucinogenic effect. And just as our plants might have different aspects, Sativa might be more head high alertness where we're feeling much more um, ability to have energy versus our indica plants where we might have more relaxation and more pain relief. It's sifting through the information. And I think the key thing is it's a team-based approach. We really need to talk to one another, uh, talk to our healthcare providers. That could be your family physician, the person who's authorizing cannabis, and also looking for really well-informed information. We want you to have your consent. We want you to have informed consent. And part of that is enlisting the help of other people in your team. So what next, Dr. Tange? Thanks, Christelle. Uh, so when we start looking at this kind of stuff, uh, often people still associate uh, cannabis as kind of the old Cheech and Chong viewpoint of blunts and joints and, and getting high and, and some sort of culture. Uh, but now we've seen really an industrialization of cannabis. We're looking at things like high-end drinks, uh, candies and gummies and different uh, bakery goods and foods. Uh, we see it in vaporized products. Uh, and we also see it in pill form uh, medication-wise, but also this is available in many of our cannabis stores in Canada. So we've seen quite a shift from what we used to see, including some of the topicals, and we're seeing some anecdotal evidence that topicals seem to be helping a lot uh, for people in pain by literally running, rubbing it on arthritic hands and painful joints. Uh, again, I'm gonna shift it back to our pharmacist. So when you're talking to someone about 
what would be the best to use? Uh, what kind of recommendations, Christelle, do you often make? Thanks, Dr. Tange. Uh, again, it goes back to there are many different kinds of forms. Just like a medications have pill forms, liquids, so does cannabis. So going through all of them, there might be inhaled formulations in the form of being able to smoke it or vaporizing it. And there are oral or a cannabis oil. Then we do also have our cannabinoids, which are more prescription uh, cannabis products. So the key thing is that, is this your first line? Traditionally using cannabis is low on the options. It might be after you've trialed your medications, first line, second line, and this is very individualized. So the key thing is working with your family physician, working within your health home to see what's best for you for why you're treating it. So it might be, I want to be safe. I don't want to cause any other concerns. So it's always weighing the pros against the cons. So the benefits versus the harm. So the key thing is to have that very informed conversation with your family physician or the person who would be authorizing your prescription. Keep connected with them and see what's best for you and knowing how to take them would be appropriate. What else to add, Dr. Tange? Thanks, Christelle. I, I, I certainly believe in, in one major piece to this is that uh, it really does depend on, on trying to reduce some of the risks as well. Certainly smoking cannabis uh, is a carcinogen. Vaporizing significantly reduces that risk, but then you only get short bursts of, of the, the cannabinoids and the terpenes that we're looking for effect. Uh, and even more so, a lot of the smaller vapes uh, are still burning the cannabis and there still are some of the carcinogens that are coming through it unless you're looking at something like a volcano. And, and the volcano itself is really expensive, uh, hundreds of dollars. Uh, so often people uh, struggle with that cost. This is where looking at more of the orals, uh, so the pills or the, liquid, the liquids or uh, some of the drops that some people put under the tongues may be more beneficial. But then there's not a lot of evidence or research in this area. Most of the research is actually on the smoked cannabis. So it does get really tricky. Now, when we start looking at cannabis and pain and what some of the evidence is, first of all, this is the gold standard study. And I'm not going to show you a bunch of studies, but the great Mark Ware did the very first study with less than 30 people uh, looking at how pain improved by adding cannabis to the regimen. And they used different levels of THC, but the most potent THC they used was actually 9.4%. So actually the evidence suggests it's not for just getting high. In fact, all the evidence for cannabis and helping pain is actually with THC and not with CBD. So it's not uh, kind of this unfortunate stigmatizing viewpoint that THC is e evil and CBD is good. It's actually quite the opposite. CBD, we don't know much about. We have some theoretical bases of how it is an anti-inflammatory but it's actually THC that has the best evidence. And there is some rat studies, some animal studies showing that animals tolerate pain better with the combination of CBD and THC. They actually put them on a hot plate. I don't do this, just to be clear. They put them on a hot plate and on that hot plate, they see how long uh, they can stay and they actually will stay longer uh, if uh, CBD and THC are combined. So it does get quite interesting. Uh, when we start looking at the evidence, the evidence was pretty clear back in 2015. We started looking at systematic reviews and meta-analyses really showing that THC or cannabinoids significantly improve chronic pain and, and quite specific to neuropathic pain, uh, along with spasticity that we see in MS, which can be quite painful as well. Uh, unfortunately, we've now seen a barrage of newer studies showing high potency and chronic heavy use of THC products may actually increase people's pain and make things worse. We've kind of heard that story before. So this gets a little bit tricky as to now we need to figure out, well, how much, when, what percentage, and we're still learning some of those aspects. So how do I approach it with patients? Uh, I usually try to focus on the oral knowing that they're going to get similar levels of uh, the THC and CBD and the cannabinoids and some of the terpenes. We do have to be careful if the oils have been 
uh, heated to be made, it can burn off some of the terpenes. And we can lose some of the entourage effects. Uh, so cold pressed is usually a better way to go. We want to start low and we want to go slow, but we want to go. So usually what I do is I usually start with a higher CBD or pure CBD process. This is a lot less risks in comparison to THC, and we'll get to that in a sec. And then I slowly increase the level of THC based on the response that someone has. Now, there is a big problem with all of this, and that's cost. Uh, there's still not a lot of acceptance from insurance providers uh, and uh, healthcare systems and the use of cannabinoids, which is really quite unfortunate. Without a question, for some people, these, these products make a huge difference in their lives. And with some people, unfortunately, uh, they don't have that much of an effect. Now, that's not a big deal if I'm prescribing a medication. It doesn't seem to work. I stop, especially if it's fully covered. But when I start prescribing uh, cannabis and it doesn't work, it's going to cost some people hundreds of dollars to determine whether or not it has an effect. And that can be really difficult and quite simply a barrier of treatment to many people. We really need to see this change. Uh, so again, I'm going to shift over to the pharmacist. If somebody comes in and asks you about, you know, do I take the pill or do I take uh, liquids or do I take THC or do I take CBD? What's often the approach that you would give them? Uh, passing this again over to Christelle. Thank you. And before I attend to that question, I just want to remind folks, having an illness, if you can liken it to having a car with four flat tires, just as we need to inflate more than one tire to get the car moving, it's the same thing with cannabis. So you may be hoping that cannabis will help you with your condition, help you with living with your pain. It may but we actually have to utilize and inflate those four tires. So as has been mentioned, we need to attend to our nutrition, to our mental health, to our all aspects of our health in order to support um, us living with pain. So if someone were to come talk to me, if I was working at a clinic, let's, let's say with family physicians and my other allied healthcare professionals, I would have a frank conversation. What do they know? What are their expectations? Do we need to work on how is this in combination with medications or current physical activity and movement? I think the key thing is also, are we looking to focus on our function or do we want this completely eliminated? So it's balancing what are our expectations and what does the evidence show? And I think that's never an easy conversation, but keep the conversation going. Connect with your team members. It could be myself in your health home when you happen to be visiting your family physician. But it's really crucial to keep that great therapeutic relationship, we hope, with your family physician and are those that you're interested in speaking to about, do I need to start with THC? Do I need to have slow doses and starting low and going slow? Absolutely. Because we need to consider that also things like other medications we're currently taking could play a role in how our cannabis is impacted and vice versa. How are other medications in combination with cannabis are impacted or not? So keep the conversation going again, and there's never one right answer. What next? Perfect. Thanks, Christelle. That, that is a good question. What is next? Well, let's talk about what could be some of the harms of cannabis. Uh, now, the first one was IQ. There was this whole belief that if you use cannabis, your IQ drops. It's actually based out of a study in, in Dunedin, New Zealand. And what they saw is they followed people over decades and those who uh, were using cannabis to the point of meeting a diagnosis for a cannabis addiction. Uh, the more times they were diagnosed with cannabis addiction, the lower their IQ scores were dropping. Uh, it turns out uh, when they did a couple of twin twin studies where one twin used cannabis and the other did not, there's actually no difference in IQ scores. And what they did see is that adverse childhood experiences, trauma in childhood actually had more of an effect as well as the sociological implications and psychological implications 
of, of uh, trauma and adverse childhood experiences had the effect uh, on the IQ and it wasn't the cannabis at all. So we don't think cannabis long-term makes you dumb. It, it may impair you a little bit uh, when you're uh, using it at the time, but it doesn't have long-term deleterious effects on your intelligence. Uh, what about mental health? Well, we do know that cannabis can uh, uh, cause anxiety and worsen anxiety, especially THC. Now, CBD, on the other hand, has actually had good studies showing that it has anxiolytic properties. In fact, a study where it went head-to-head -head against uh, diazepam or Valium, which is a very powerful anxiolytic, and really they had similar outcomes uh, at the end of the, the trial. In fact, it seemed that CBD had better anticipatory anxiety effect. Uh, that is the anticipation of something coming to you and the anxiety of that happening. So the anxiety of getting on a plane, the anxiety of going to your doctor's appointment, those kind of anxieties were lessened more with CBD than that of value. So it does have some good anxiolytic properties. It seems to have some antipsychotic properties, but what it's really good at is attenuating those antipsychotic or those psychotic effects or psychotomimetic effects uh, of THC, i.e. THC can make people feel anxious and paranoid, but with higher levels of CBD mixed in it, it can drop those side effects. Um, there are some other, now, just to be clear about depression, there is no evidence that cannabis causes depression, whether THC, CBD, or anything else. Uh, but there is evidence that can worsen depression. And, there's, and that would be THC specific. There is also uh, no evidence that it makes uh, PTSD worse. It can improve some of the symptoms of PTSD. Uh, and one of the hard parts of it though, is that when somebody wants to undergo treatment, uh, it becomes much different because treatment for PTSD is often facing uh, the trauma itself and any sort of medication that leads to avoidance or uh, kind of numbing out from that uh, reduces the benefit of the trauma therapy. It's important to remember, we've talked a bit about uh, trauma-informed care. Trauma-informed care is, is important in uh, non-psychological clinics. So if you're going to see your obstetrician, it's not a good place to end up getting triggered. Uh, but often uh, when we look at pain, uh, there is a significant increased risk of trauma, uh, a 100% increase in some studies in comparison to the population of PTSD. Uh, this is huge, and we shouldn't be just focused on being trauma-informed. We should be treating the trauma. PTSD is treatable and curable. And so that really leads us to the need to treat that. Sorry, that, that is my quick rant and we'll move on. Uh, other cannabis side effects. There are some other ones. You've probably heard of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome or cannabis actually leading to vomiting and feeling really quite unwell. The only treatment for this is to stop using cannabis. It seems to be linked more to THC and we actually have a, uh, a group here in Calgary doing a big study, a CHR study, looking at what causes hyperemesis and uh, you know why we actually see all of it. So looking right down at that pathophysiology, uh, theoretically, and not just theoretically, but evidence-wise, cannabis is a really good antiemetic or removes nausea and was actually one of its first reasons it was approved for medical use was in individuals taking chemotherapy and the nausea that was caused by that was significantly improved as well as the lack of appetite was significantly improved. So it's quite interesting that if you use it too much and too often, uh, we often see it in heavy chronic users that we actually see an opposite effect similar to what we talk about with pain. Works really well at pain with lower doses and less amounts but when we start getting too high, we see worsening outcomes in pain. And finally, we do know cannabis can be addictive. I know that there's some people out there that would like to say it's not. Uh, in, in my addiction world, I've treated it many of times. Uh, it is treatable. It is uh, something that can go into cure remission. People can recover from it. But at the same time, we have to be really aware that if you're using cannabis every day and you're not able to stop using it, uh, then we start getting in trouble. It can lead to some tolerance and it can lead to dependency. The withdrawal effects are usually the opposite 
uh, of what we see with the benefits, which is what we see in all aspects of withdrawal. So when you stop using it, you, you can stop sleeping as well. You can stop eating as well. You become irritable. You can uh, have heightened pain. This is actually really important in the perioperative time period. Before uh, going for an operation, many people uh, may be using cannabis and then can't use it in the hospital. There's a high risk of going into withdrawal and having much higher pain after the surgery. So make sure you talk to your anesthetist and surgeon about this fact. And there's ways to treat this, including using Nabilone uh, to reduce the risk of going into withdrawal and requiring more pain treatment. Uh, again, driving is a big problem. There's a zero tolerance program. Uh, so graduated driver licenses. So these are learner's licenses in your first couple of years of having a driver's license. Uh, if you're caught using cannabis and being impaired, it's a 30 day suspension and a seven day vehicle seizure. This is uh, something really important. And then you'll end up being a learner's or a graduated driver licensing for an extra two years. And there are criminal penalties. For those who don't, aren't just initiating driving, you can still have your license suspended similar to that of using uh, alcohol or other substances. You can still get a 90 day license suspension and a three day vehicle seizure and end up with mandatory remedial education. And there are fines on top of this as well. Remember, uh, we've had drug impaired driving offenses being in the criminal code for decades, but now that also includes cannabis. We wanna be really careful. Now, there used to be some guidelines about not driving a certain amount of hours after using, uh, you know, Health Canada and Ottawa have backed off on that to just simply say, if you're in anywhere impaired, not to drive. It doesn't matter if you're ingesting or smoking or vaping. Uh, if you are impaired, you should not be driving. And certainly when we're initiating cannabis, we should not be driving during that initial period. Uh, but when it, you know, when we start getting to beyond the impairment, which some people can get to without question, then it gets a little bit tricky and we just want to be very careful behind the wheel. Finally, and, and probably one of the most important aspects is just like when you go for surgery, often you're not allowed to have your cannabis in hospital, although we're working on changing that, especially when it's prescribed, uh, I guess in Canada it would be authorized when it's authorized. Uh, having it in hospital is going to be really important not to go into withdrawal. You also can't travel with it. You can't bring it into an airport, even though it's legal in Canada, it cannot go into an airport and you cannot travel outside of Canada. No international travel with cannabis. Uh, so even if it's you're flying straight to Denver, Colorado, where it is legal, it is not legal to fly it into the United States. And, and it can lead to serious criminal charges of trafficking of substances. Please do not travel with your cannabis. And it doesn't matter if it's oils or pills or the, the buds themselves, please don't do so. This again can lead to some difficulties, but talk to your doctor if you're using THC. We do have ways to, to cover that while you're gone with Nabilone, which is a synthetic cannabis uh, or a synthetic THC that we can prescribe to cover you while you're gone. So make sure you're having these discussions with your physician before you travel. Don't get stuck in a difficult position.